Welcome to the Real Turf Techs Podcast for the technician that wants to get real. Follow along as we talk to industry professionals and address hot topics that we all face. Along the way, we'll learn tips and tricks. I'm your host, Trent Manning. Let's have some fun. Welcome to the Real Turf Techs Wisconsin Roadshow Recap with Austin Wright. Thank you, Austin, for being here. Thanks, Trent. I'm I'm excited to be here and excited to see that you made it back to Georgia. And it was a it was a great week up here. So yes, it was. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, I had I had so much fun. And first things first, I want to thank you and Justin Prescott for uh, having me up to speak at Justin's Club in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That was my main reason for the journey. But uh, we got to do a lot of other cool stuff along yeah. the way. That was so, uh, that was a fun event. Ahead. We'll we'll talk about that here in a little bit. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yep, um, for sure. So the way, just for the listeners, the way this is going to break down is I got the camera roll pulled up again. So hopefully I won't miss anything. And unfortunately, Austin wasn't able to be with me when I was in Chicago, and I stopped at Chicago Country Club and Madonna. But I'm going to scroll through some of those pictures and. Uh, see what jogs my memory one of the first things i noticed at chicago golf club is well obviously it's one of the oldest courses i think in the country or something like that i don't remember when it was like 1880 or something it was really old but i met with the technician there tony super nice guy the facility was pretty old but he does a really good job of keeping everything organized everything's clean and He's doing a great job there, and he's doing it all by himself. He said he'd been looking for an assistant for like a year and a half and hadn't been able to find anybody. Wow. And he's got 18 holes? Yes, 18 holes. And I think it was about 100 acres. I mean, it was a pretty small property, but Mm -hmm. it was amazing. And, yeah, they're in like the top 15 or something of golf courses. Amazing facility. A lot of history there. Very cool. Super flat piece of property and they had a lot of native areas kind of in between the holes and they pay a farmer i guess to come in and bell it for hay oh there you go yep they just uh done that and i don't all the greens complexes you know it was like a square almost made me i don't know that much about golf but it made me think of like really old traditional golf club Mm -hmm. old architecture Yeah, where the bunkers, if they wanted a bunker, they just dig a hole in the ground, pile the dirt up behind it, and then fill the hole in with sand and call that a bunker. There you go. What uh, what turf type do you remember, Trent? I think Kentucky bluegrass, I'm pretty sure, and then bent grass greens. And I think the bent greens had some poe in them, but not a whole lot, if I remember right. That's really good for, you know, an older facility like that. Yeah, it was beautiful out there, too. Of course, timing with the leaves and all that. And some of the the collars were unbelievable. The slope of the collar, he said they mowed it with a Toro 1000, and it took two people. So you had a person using the mower and then another person with a rope holding the mower up on the collar. Wow. Because it was at such an angle. I mean, it was nuts. <laughs> Never. Uh, wow, look at that. Yeah, you're right, man. Yeah, if no one's holding that bunker or holding that mower up, it is right in the bunker. Yeah, I mean, it's pro- at least a 30-degree slope into the bunker off the green, and they're mowing that with a aluminum drum. Mm-hmm. Tony, had he had a Foley 653 real grinder, pretty new. So I was uh, trying to get some pictures for tips and tricks, and he'd made a little, uh, it was a piece of pipe with a hole drilled in it, and uh, an eye bolt and that's what he uses to pick up his 5510 cut units so it just goes over the pin that attaches to the machine okay so it acts like a sleeve and then it goes through the pin like the the pin hole there and basically locks it in like it would that's really cool the fact that it picks it up from that that toro pin and then you're lifting it from a normal standpoint that's 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 a cool little device there So after I left Chicago Golf Club, I went over to Medina to see Brian Bressler. And as soon as you pull in, it's this 
massive clubhouse. And I think Medina had 54 holes, so three 18-hole golf courses. Really impressive the whole facility was. That is an amazing clubhouse. And then you go in Brian's shop, and it's like eating off the floor. I mean, I'd be happy to eat off the floor because everything is so clean. He keeps it spotless in there. And when we were doing the testing at his shop, we were giving him a hard time about, you know, do you work in here? You do all your work outside and this is just for show, you know? Yeah, crazy. But I, his, uh, I loved his parts room because it's all drawers and all the parts are stored in drawers. I don't, you know, it just looks a lot neater and organized. That is a good looking parts room. Definitely something to take with you. And then his pride and joy was this air compressor. I don't know what it cost but it's a rotary screw air compressor with a dryer on it (laughs) and he was all excited about this air compressor that he had in there another cool thing that he had that i really liked was he had this uh, storage cube and you could store used oil waste fuel and waste antifreeze and it was all in this one containment and it was a double wall tank so you didn't have to have secondary containment underneath it and whatever company he uses would come and pump it all out and it's all right there in one spot i thought it was pretty slick setup did he mention where he got that tank no i don't remember okay if you're on twitter just send brian a dm he's gonna get a bunch of dms now and say what is this about (laughs) but yeah no he'd be happy to tell you where he got it from he just got a, a new advent 530 a little wheel loader pretty uh, cool machine so they were checking it out making sure everything was good to go before they put it in service is that an articulating machine yes yeah okay yes yeah, it's just like a little mini wheel loader mm-hmm. and i've i think uh, kevin henniger he uses them up in canada i think there's a lot more golf courses going to them versus a uh, skid steer okay and not that they wouldn't have a skid steer but for loading sand i think they're a lot better Mm -hmm. then he had this really cool uh welding table in there that was uh mobile on casters and it came with all the clamps and it's got all the holes on top so you can clamp down different fixtures and you're working on a flat surface really like the idea of that too and then his uh mig welder uh 255 Multimatic Miller, so it would do TIG, ARC. Oh, the table, how it has all the, the mounting hardware underneath it there. The uh, brackets yeah, yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty He's, sweet. Yeah, he said it came with all of that, which is, yeah, really cool. Oh, and this was kind of a first for me. At Medina, the shop has their own bathroom for the shop guys. I thought it was pretty nice. No way. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and the crew and everybody else has got their set of restrooms, but the shop had their own set with a shower back there, too. I mean, this looks like it should be in the clubhouse, how nice it was. Oh, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's super nice for sure. So the other thing I really liked there, he had all these workstations, and they were all set up the same, so a lot of the same tools and all that kind of stuff at each workstation. And the other thing, they have a... I should get Brian probably to talk about this more in depth, but he's got a apprenticeship program where he brings in technicians and they give them a toolbox, Husky box, fully stocked with Husky tools, about a $3,000 value. And if they stay there for the three years, I think it was, they get to keep the tools, which I thought that was super awesome that he's doing that trying to get more younger people in there that's really cool yeah it's just a super nice facility it's huge and the equipment storage and the amount of equipment they got it was it was pretty impressive they took me out on the course for a ride around are they serving all 54 holes out of the one location yes yeah okay yeah everything happens at that one location so they basically had a huge barn where everything was stored And then the shop, offices, and break room were in another building. Okay. He had two lifts in the shop. I thought that was pretty neat. And then, of course, like a lot of shops are, this was the old horse stables back in the day. And they had turned that into a shop. But they'd done an 
awesome job renovating it. I love the fact that older facilities have the ability to renovate these old spaces because it really brings in so much character that you, you just can't build. It's just part of it, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because, I, I mean, that was a cool thing. Everything's painted and it looks nice, but when you really look, you can tell that they're like eight by eight beams that's uh, holding it up. You know I mean? A lot of mm-hmm. cool architecture that was not lost. Yeah. And another cool thing, they had skylights that opened and closed on top of the roof. And when they were renovating the building, they asked Brian, like, you want to take these out? And he's like, I don't know. Do they work? And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, they still work. So he's still... But, you know, they left them in there and they can open and close them. Not that they open and close them a whole lot, but oh, yeah. that's the skylights I was talking about. I thought it was super cool. Oh, yeah. On warm days, get the little extra airflow going through there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after I left Medina, I made my way up to downtown Kenosha, Wisconsin. First time I've never I'd, been uh, down to that area before. First time I'd ever been there. And it was a cool little town. I had a nice downtown area. I stayed pretty much right on Lake Michigan. When I booked the hotel, I tried to get a Lakeview room, but uh, it didn't didn't quite work out. Did not have a, a view of the lake, but beautiful little city. And I got up the next morning and met Justin and Austin at Kenosha Country Club. It was really cool to be able to host an event for the Wisconsin GCSA tag teamed in with uh the mags chapter and and have it be in kenosha there right on the border and and kind of get a group of guys together and gals you know that really haven't spent much time together before and this was a prime location so i'm super thankful that justin was willing to host and he had a great little facility there for sure so what's the mags chapter i think it's mid-america it's kind of part of the chicago okay chicago chapter yeah, and there were several that came up, right, from Chicago land. Yeah, I think we had three or four that came up. Okay. And then most of the others were from Wisconsin or somewhere? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say most of them were kind of from the Madison, Milwaukee area. Mm-hmm. Sand Valley guys, I mean, we had probably one of the longest drives, about three hours down there. But we had a pretty good group there, about about 20 or so people and some great education provided by yourself and it was it was a fun event no it was it it was a great time yeah and i mean everybody uh seemed entertained hopefully uh i did okay at that but uh i really enjoyed i mean i love speaking and just getting the word out there so the presentation i done was on growing your network and then we also talked about mental health and how important that is it was really good everybody seemed to enjoy it and i got a lot of good feedback and even after the mental health section, one guy come up to me and, uh, you know, talked to me off to the side and told me how much it meant to him. And it seems like every time I talk about mental health, usually there's at least one that'll come mm-hmm. up and say, I really appreciate you saying that. So it makes me feel good for sure. And I'm glad that you talked about it because it's something that's becoming more and more, you know, into the spotlight of everybody's lives. And, you know, in our industry, we we tend to carry a lot of stress and take a lot of pride in the work that we put out. And it's really important to be able to openly discuss mental health, especially with people that are kind of living a similar life as you. So I, I'm very thankful for it. And I think it's going to benefit a lot of people. Awesome. So yeah, kind of after I did my thing, y'all did a little shop tour around Justin's shop and he's got a really nice setup there. He does. He does. And kind of talking about Brian's or his parts room has a lot of the drawers. Justin's has a lot of file cabinets. And so like his whole shop area had a good amount of file cabinets and things like that, that really keep everything good and tidy and looking nice. And it really was a nice shop to go through. And Justin's also a CTIM and, and his facility definitely showed it. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was definitely squared away. You got to say Toro the cat, you know, it's like a lot of facilities have dogs, but Toro the cat was really cool. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Yep. That was, uh, and I mean, a lot of, I've seen a lot of clubs that have shop cats, but that's the first cat I've ever met that was named Toro. Mm -hmm. Had a little spot there on top of the toolbox and the shop was his home. Yep. That's right. No, it was cool. Very cool. 
So after I left there, I followed Austin all the way back to Sand Valley. And he was nice enough to put me up in an Airbnb that was owned by his in-laws. So it worked out awesome for me and I think for him too. Yeah, it was it, it was great to be able to have you come up and and stay nearby and be able to hang out with us for a full day. And you kind of got the full the full gist of the operation kind of during our our fall shutdown. One well, so how long did we ride around? So on Wednesday morning, I get up and I come over to your shop around 7 or something. And we didn't get in the ranger immediately but we rode around for we had to ride around for five hours didn't we yeah it was at least four or five hours i mean yeah and doing a full tour like that i mean the resort is a big it's a it's a really large operation and golf courses and and then also all the growth that's happening as well i mean it was really cool to have you come out and ride around and see all that and and you know see the mature courses and then also get some sneak peeks of of what's coming down the line yeah no it was it was an incredible piece of property and just so everybody will be envious like i was austin gets to drive his polaris ranger to work every day from his house and what is two and a half miles or something yep it's about two and a half miles on the nose driving so it's it's about a five minute yeah. trip yeah it was incredible i just i don't know it's one of the things i think i like the most and you get to drive it around out on the course too. Yep. So I have all my shop tools, um, my toolbox in the back of it. And, you know, we also have a, a shop Polaris that we have equipped. And it's really neat being able to drive to work in your own personal vehicle and then use it out on the golf courses. And it's a huge tool that we use all the time. And four wheel drive, you saw out there, I mean, everything's sand, it's bare sand. Oh yeah. Yeah. Paths are sand. I mean, especially during construction, pulling a lot of equipment out a lot. The winch is getting a full workout frequently. Yeah, I'm sure it is because yeah, we went through some pretty hairy stuff. I mean, nothing too bad, but it'd been pretty dry too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It had been pretty dry. Um, we do have a couple water trucks that come come around for erosion control and and those areas can get a little hairy especially with the ruts that they tend to make sometimes you have to kick it in four wheel drive and and let her eat sometimes that's right <laughs> but i mean you have a, a huge facility too and a huge property how many holes of golf is it so we have 54 on the resort side and and then we have uh, 18 for the Lido golf course, which is just across the road. And then we will have another 18 for the Sedge Valley course. Yeah. That's incredible. Plus the tennis. Yeah. Courts. So Austin's got a, Austin's got a super awesome facility too. And ton of how many total acres is it there? It's right around 2000. I couldn't give you an exact number off the top of my head, but yeah, as, as we've continued to grow, I think it's right around 2000. Yeah, no, it was uh, crazy. Oh, and then, yeah, the other thing at Sand Valley, you just dig this uh, top dressing sand out of the ground. That was something that kind of blew my mind, too, when we were getting it trucked in. Yeah, that's it's a very special piece of property, being able to dig into a dune and, and use that for your top dressing sand. And then Rob Doom, our director of agronomy, he'll go through and check the sand and make sure that it's what he's looking for for these particular holes. And then we'll go ahead and get it screened for greens. Everything gets screened that goes on the greens. And then, but all of our fairways, tees, fine fescue top dressing just comes right out of the dune. Yeah, it's crazy. And you said that whatever couple years you get a company to come in and screen the sand? Every few years. So we'll, they'll come in and they'll screen large amounts to last a couple years per course. And then how many pits do y'all have around the property? We have right around one pit per golf course. Okay. Depending on the type of sand that was used to build the greens on the given golf course, that's where we try to match that sand the best of our abilities to, to keep that, that same aggregate throughout the top dressing process. Oh, okay. I got you. No, that's, yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, so your greens are not USGA specs, right? Correct. Yeah. They would be considered just a push-up green, but everything is sand. They did relocate 
some sands for different greens. So instead of it being just a pure push up, they did move around some different sands for the greens complexes. But yeah, as far as drainage goes, we, we have plenty of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But even still then, you still had the mud holes everywhere. Yeah, on the paths. Yeah, yeah on the, the paths, yeah. which was yeah. kind of surprising to me with everything being sand. Yeah, it's that, that top layer, that organic. It, it can get it can get pretty pretty muddy. Mm-hmm. Are y'all responsible for running the water trucks, or is that another company? It would be part of the construction crews. It's part of our employees. Okay, very um, cool. But, but it would be considered, you could call it the construction, the golf course construction operation. Does that fall in under you anyway? It does not. The superintendents assist with that, but I don't have to manage the water trucks. They're all rented machines. Gotcha. Yeah. And then you top dress all your fairways? All fine fescue. Yep. Yeah. So that would be tees, fairways, everything in play gets, we'll call it a heavier rate of sand in the fall. And then uh, we do what we can in season. The process that you were seeing was our fall top dressing to where we're putting down a, a pretty heavy amount of sand to not only help kind of smooth everything out, but really utilize to manage thatch, which luckily fine fescue is not a, a heavy thatch producing turf, but also to protect the crown going into winter. So it, it really serves for multiple purposes. And, and we're lucky that we have the ability to do that. Yeah, no, very cool stuff. And then and, well, and y'all were pretty much top dressing everything, right? Yep. So we also did greens too while we were out there. And we'll, we'll go out with a heavier rate of sand for the greens. And then we'll needle tine the greens, kind of work that all in. Uh, it also serves for the same purpose of protecting the crown going into winter. And then, yeah, we'll needle tine it, roll it, spray it for snow mold, and put up all our snow fence and let them go to bed wake them up in the spring and what's the deal with the snow fence why do you put it around the greens so we actually want to try to keep the snow on the green as much as we can so the snow fence actually kind of traps the snow because we we want to have that coverage throughout the winter with the really cold temps that we can get up here it really serves as that blanket gotcha Uh, yeah that makes sense and then we also put in a large areas uh, just to keep sand in the bunkers or in the native areas to try to keep it off the golf course. And it's something that we've learned as the operation continues to evolve. We've learned these spots where we need to hit them and, and keep the snow fence up. And, uh, yeah, we put miles and miles of snow fence, uh, across property. Yeah. It was a pretty impressive operation. How many people do y'all have on the crew? At peak will be so like, you know, Mm -hmm. June, July at peak we're we're about at 100 wow and then we'll dwindle we're a lot lower on the shoulder seasons like everybody Mm -hmm. and then it's just we have a a handful of full-time year-round crew members and then all their managers are all year round right but yeah super beautiful piece of property y'all had some really good views especially if you like looking at sand (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah the the sand really really makes it pretty out there no, it does. Yep. Big native areas. When pretty much it's the fine fescue and then it goes to native, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. So we have bent grass greens and then everything else is fine fescue and and then fading off of the managed turf grass goes to kind of a an outer rough fine fescue and then it blends into the native area, native sedge, sand yeah. trees. So I thought, I mean, it was a super cool look for me. I don't play golf. I will say that with, you know, the, the architects that have done all the, all the golf courses, they've done an exceptional job of making something that is relatively new look like it's been there for decades. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. One, even like the picture we're looking at now with the old house foundation that got turned into a bunker. Yeah. That was really cool. That was really cool. Building Mammoth Dunes, hole number seven. David Kidd's operation as they were clearing and to shape the golf courses, they found this old settler's foundation. And instead of them 
are just continuing to do their thing. They're like, no, let's, let's keep that. And they made it into a really cool, cool bunker that is definitely one to play at your own risk for sure. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful swinging a club in there. Yeah. Get a ball in the eye. But it's, it's really cool. Really cool little spot. And then as I was taking all these pictures, Luna had to get in most of them. Yeah. Nina. Nina. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Nina. Yep. Jeez. Yep. She, uh, she has to sneak in as many photos as she can. Talk about great life for dogs out there, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Total of seven dogs across all the different courses. And, uh-huh. and they got they have a, their own herd and pack and <laughs> just get a love well, they life all, and run. They all get along good too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah Which they're, is cool too, yeah. Yeah, they they love each other and they're so excited when – Someone from across the road comes over, and then they get to play and wrestle for a while. And uh-huh. Life of the dog. That's pretty cool. Yep. Tell me about this uh, I-beam you got in your one shop with the hoist that goes back and forth. Yep. So um, so this picture here is the Lido shop, and in our main hub, we also have an I-beam hoist, and we've really utilized it to manage just lifting anything and everything, primarily cutting units. Mm-hmm. And so it's a three ton I beam with a two ton hoist and we'll use it for pulling top dressers or pulling engines or, but primarily it runs from our main work area into the real grinding area. And yeah, it's very just a cool. great tool for us and it's hugely handy. Yeah, I really, I like that idea. I thought that was an awesome idea. And I really liked your indoor wash bays. Yeah, so coming up that from Kansas, you just valve off your, you know, your water when, when it's cold, and then you turn it back on, and, you know, when you're ready to wash. And up here in Wisconsin, you have to valve it off and blow it out to protect it. And so, what we've done is incorporate indoor wash bays into our shop operations, and this allows us to really wash the equipment from top to bottom and make it look as new as we possibly can every year. And we'll wash cutting units off before we throw them in the grinders. And mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's a great tool to have definitely for the duration of time that it's, it's pretty darn cold up here to where we can't have water running outside. Yeah. I thought that was a great idea. And I don't know that I need one in the South, but I sure would like to have one. It'd be awesome. Oh yeah. To it's, have set up like that. It's nice. And, you know, none of it runs uh, to the septic. Everything goes to a holding tank, so it gets pumped out. And gas, oil, hydraulic, especially if we're working on diagnosing something that isn't really wanting to show itself, it gives us a good opportunity to wash it, let it dry, and then we can really see where the issue lies. Mm-hmm. No, that was, that was very cool. Oh, I didn't ask. Where does all the water come from, the Sand Valley water? So we have a few different wells wells would feed our irrigation ponds and then that's where the water would come from but in our area basically we're sand to water so it's and it's super clean it's it's fantastic water when you didn't have like a lot of lakes on property either right all the lakes that we have are man-made lined but yeah we have a few but they do they do serve for most of them serve to assist with uh, irrigation and what was the the idea behind this green and the hole in the middle of it? Yep. So this is hole nine on the sandbox, and it has a bowl like right in the middle of it. It's a ginormous green for a par three hole, as you can see. I mean, it's it's less than I think less than like seventy yard shot, and the green's probably forty yards wide. It seems like. Yeah, but yeah. yeah it's we a have huge a huge green. There's a there's a bowl down in the middle of it, and the superintendents they'll throw the pin right in the middle of that bowl, and you, we can always tell when the pin's in the bowl because at the shop you can hear people hooting and hollering for hole in ones, and oh, it's, man. yeah, it and it's right there next to where the food truck is, so there's always people up there eating and watching, and very it's a fun spectator hole right there, so. It was really cool that Core Crenshaw put that in there because it, it really does make for a fun experience for the golfers. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. No, that's, yeah, that was awesome. Never seen anything like that before. Super cool. Oh, yeah, and then I, I seen you were getting your tracks out. 
Will you talk a little bit about the the way the seasonal stuff that you wrap it all up, saran wrap, and put it on the shelf? Yeah. So what we're seeing right here, the picture that we're looking at is our tracks for our Polaris Ranger 1000. And what we do, since we are a seasonal operation, uh, we do convert from uh, maintaining turf grass and then switching over to winter maintenance where we would do cross-country ski trails, ice skating, snowshoeing, fat tire biking, pond hockey. And so we have to have ways to get around the golf courses and get into the different areas when we do have feet of snow on the ground. And so these tracks, what we've done is we'll go through, pull them off the machine, clean them really good, perform the, the proper uh, storage procedures on whatever the machine is, and then we'll get it on pallet racking and then use pallet wrap to wrap it all up. And then we'll throw it on the pallet rack for that six months or so. And then we'll bring it back down and unwrap them. And we know that basically we just need to knock the dust off of them and then they're ready to go for for whatever they are. So that also goes for our golf cart chargers. Mm-hmm. And we, we were doing that process while you came up. And yeah. we'll take those, we'll bring them in the shop, we'll blow them out. And and you saw how much sand comes out of those things. Oh, uh, I could yeah, I couldn't believe the amount of sand coming out of there. I mean, it it is it's wild how sand gets in every nook and cranny of everything. So yeah, we take those, we blow them out real thoroughly, and then we wrap those up really good with wrap with pallet wrap, and then we we actually store them with the golf cart, so the charger stays with that particular golf cart during the winter storage. When I was thinking, I seen you put some of your greens mowers on pallets too. Yep. Walking greens mowers. Yep. So during the duration of time, as our winter equipment comes down off the pallet racking, we try to store as much as we possibly can back on the pallet racking. And so our walking greens mowers all get stored on pallet racking. So we'll take those in once once the superintendent say, hey, we're done walk mowing. We'll wash them, service them, grind them, relief them. And then we'll get those put on pallet racks and we just use heavy duty zip ties and we zip tie the mowers uh, to the pallets and throw them up on the pallet racking. So we know that when we pull them down in the spring, we knock the dust off and they're ready to rock and roll. No, that's awesome. I think that's really cool. Yeah, it's, we call it our seasonal transition time and there's, it's on, you know, both ends of the season and it requires a lot of, a lot of labor going into it, but it really gives us a head start for whatever we're going to be doing the next season. Mm-hmm. When even down here in the South, I could see us doing some of those things, not to the extent that y'all do up there, but we still have stuff that's somewhat seasonal, mm-hmm. just like our, you know, back and all our leaf, you know, removal stuff. We're not really using that year round. We're only using it for a few months. Yeah, so, yeah, you guys can treat it the same for sure. Yeah, you could do do some stuff like that. So I think it's really clever what you're doing and optimizing the space that you have, even though you have a ton of property. A ton of property. Yeah. A lot of acreage to maintain. Yeah, a ton. So, yeah, that was Wednesday. I hung out with you all day, and then I got up Thursday morning and drove to Foley Company which was a really cool experience. I hung out with the marketing guy, Chad, and one of the sales guys, Kurt, and they gave me the the full tour of their facility. And they even uh, had my name up on the screens around the shop, telling everybody to welcome me. And I was there from Atlanta, even with the Real Turf Text logo on there. I mean, it was super cool. And I posted a picture on Twitter of... uh, how they welcome me there. And then the other thing I was really surprised. So they give me a factory tour and I didn't take a single picture because every factory I've been in most of the time, even before you walk around, they make you sign a, you know, a non-disclosure agreement mm-hmm. or something. So I didn't even take a picture. And then, so we tour the whole thing and I asked Chad, I said, can I take a picture of the screen with my name on it? And he's like, yeah, you can take any pictures you want to take. I'm like, really? I can take pictures of the manufacturing process? He's like, there's no secrets in here. Yeah, you can take mm-hmm. as many pictures as you want. We encourage it. So we've done another lap around. So yeah. I took uh, 
took a lot of pictures as uh, I was walking around, but they got an awesome facility there and they're trying to crank out their air Two G two line of products. I think some of the components had been back ordered. So they'd really got that line ramped up mm-hmm. and just all the cool stuff in there. Uh, everything CNC milling machines. So they build the Foley grinders and air Two G two all in the same facility. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's all in the same, same shop there. And they didn't talk about it, but, and I don't know exactly where they're going with it, but they have more property there. So when it's time to expand, and I think they did say something about the way the building was built, it was built for expansion too. You know, if they were to get into other stuff. Mm -hmm. They're planning for the future. They're definitely planning for the future. And And when did they move to Prescott? I don't know the exact year, but it's been three or four years, maybe. Okay, so it's relatively new. Yeah, it's relatively new. And then, like, this machine is super old, and it was one of the only machines they brought from their uh, their old factory, and it's the machine that grinds the magnets parallel mm. for the bed knife grinder. And then, yeah, whole state-of-the-art welding shop with the ventilation in there, return air. Really, really cool process. And they make all their lapping compound right there. I thought that was really cool. That is neat that they make it up all their own product like that in house. Yeah. I just, you know, I assume that somebody else made the lapping compound and they stuck their name on it, but they make it right there. But they buy all the chemicals and mix them together. And the, they got an auger and looks kind of like a homemade auger to mix the stuff together. Mm hmm. I thought that was pretty neat too. And then, so, uh, so when they make a batch like that, how big of a batch do they make? Do you know? I don't know. That's a okay. good question. I'm not exactly sure how big a batch at a time that mm-hmm. they're mixing up before they put it in the pails. And they had been sending their paint out, and now they just got it set up so they can, they're doing powder coat in house too for all their frames and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, a huge four by eight plasma cutter. So you stick a four by eight sheet of steel in there and cut out whatever you want to cut out. All CNC driven. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing the advance and technology and where where everything's going. Yeah, just everything can get more precision and and faster. Yeah, and I had uh, no idea that the Mississippi River was uh, up y'all's way. <laughs> You know, I think Mississippi and I think down here in the south and going through the state of Mississippi or maybe even Memphis area, the Mississippi mm-hmm. River. I didn't realize it run through Minnesota. So I had to had to stop and take take a picture of the the of grand old miss. Yeah. And the actually this picture is Saint Croix and Mississippi is just south of here where it runs in. But it kinda okay. run Mississippi and Saint Croix run together right there at Prescott. Okay. Pretty cool. And then, yeah, you came and stayed with me that night, Thursday night, and we got up the next morning and went and hung out with Chad Braun, which was oh, fun. Oh, man, that was so much fun. That was that was a great day. Yeah, he had, uh, I mean, just like all the pictures everybody saw on Twitter, I mean, amazing shop and set up. Everything's just so clean. And it was funny when me and Austin's walking up to the maintenance building, we weren't sure if it was a maintenance building or not. Like, it kind of looks like one. And then we saw a tractor. We're like, okay, I think we're in the right spot. <laughs> it is an amazing facility. It really, really is. I don't, I really liked his uh, exhaust setup for like his rotary blade grinding area. I thought that was super cool. And then he had all these benches built. Custom yeah, steel. the custom the custom benches were really really neat, and yeah, their own casters. I mean, that was really really cool. I mean, the attention to detail is was so cool to see in Chad's facility. Yes, for sure. He also had a overhead I beam similar to the one you had. Mm-hmm. Thought that was cool set up. Yeah, and yeah, the break room and. All, I mean, it looked like executive dining or something. I mean, you know, it didn't look like a typical shop break room. 
I no, was, it I was pretty impressed. Well, and he said that they'll have board meetings and stuff in there too. Yeah, Greens Committee meetings. Yep. out there, and it it just speaks so highly of of the way Chad and his team, you know, they maintain the facility and how much the ownership takes pride in it. And he was saying how they hosted like club tournaments with other clubs and that they would host their dinners in the in the shops. It was really cool, really cool. Yeah, I thought that was crazy that they were hosting. <laughs> I'd never heard of that, Mm-mm. hosting stuff in the shop like that. And, yeah, the other thing I liked about his uh, bay doors is they had windows on them, and I thought that was a nice touch. I actually want to see how much it would cost to convert a panel of ours to the windows that like he has here because, man, I mean, the amount of natural light that – he brings in with those is really cool and didn't he say he had it he they're like tinted and so the birds would fly into them uh, yeah yeah i think they mm-hmm. the, the bird could see the reflections so yeah would fly into them sometimes and that got annoying yeah but i think yeah first they were clear and then it faces the south so too much sun in the mm-hmm. summertime and was heating up so he got them tinted and now the birds but anyway i think that'd be a a decent problem to deal with to have some natural light coming in yeah i really like the setup or staging area he called it so where he stored all his uh real mowers after Mm -hmm. they were checked out and ready to go yeah i did that yeah and they're right there they're close by those are the delicate machines and he's got those within reach in the shop and yeah, I thought that was a really cool cool area. Yeah, and then all his equipment looking brand new, like the whatever, the 20-year-old 3150 we were looking at, and it looks new. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about how it was a 2005, and the pictures don't do the justice. No, I mean, no. the attention to detail to every single nook and cranny of that machine is polished and cleaned and greased and maintained i mean it's it's exceptional if you put a brand new one right next to it the only difference would be the the areas on the step where the paint has worn off oh right yeah exactly yeah crazy this is something you really liked and was thinking about wasn't it the putting your brand in on all the equipment yeah i thought that was really cool and and it you know it says commitment to excellence right there and so the operators have a chance to see it and take the pride in the equipment like chad does and i thought that was a really cool little little detail that can really get your teams to buy into the overall operation i really like the way he stored his spark plugs and it was in a nuts and bolts bin and i just thought that was a perfect area for him Mm mm-hmm so I'm, I'm going to see if I can get some more nuts and bolt bins and do my spark plugs that way. Yeah, his, his parts room is really, another really nice area. Super organized, yeah. well lit, yeah. really clean. The wire holder idea too, is where he has, has his, his pull cord string and all of his different wires. I, I really like that. I'm, I'm going to work on adapting something like that over in our operation. Yeah, I think it's really important to have something like that because how else do you store them? You know, even you leave them in a cabinet and then you got to, you know, I mean, it's just a hassle. So mm-hmm. a, a rack system where they hang on the wall and you can just unroll what you need and clip it off is uh, really hard to beat. And then I really like that they were thoughtful enough when they built this building that they put in all these extra circuits to have uh, charging stations. Mm-hmm. So if anyone is getting ready to update their facility, make sure you got plenty of charging stations, especially everything going electric. And we're only going to see it more and more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Overpower. You don't need to put it in right away, but just have it to where it's accessible. Oh, and then, yeah, overhead uh, lube set up. That was a super awesome thing he'd done in the shop. Mm-hmm. And he said that he used it more than... He thought he would originally. Yeah. Um, doing walkers, you know, where it's like 0.6 quarts or whatever the number is. And boom, 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 done. He just knew exactly how much was going in each machine. And that's like something you see in an auto shop or something like that. And it's really cool to see it in the golf operation. Yeah. I think, I think we'll start seeing more and more of these setups. Hopefully, um, 
it's definitely uh, on my wish list to get a setup like this. Yeah, that that staging room is really cool. Yeah, I really I really like the the staging room, and it had uh, two bay doors that exited outside, and then there was a bay door that went into the workshop, if you will. And yeah, it was just it was a really good setup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also like this little room. I don't know what they called it, but kind of their construction room. But it also had a little semi paint booth in there with ventilation so you could paint and I'm sure all over people paint tea markers and you know, I mean mm-hmm. all the stuff we end up painting at the golf course every winter. It'd be uh, super handy to have a little space like that. Yeah, like this kind of looked more like a woodworking slash paint room. I inspire to have a woodworking slash paint room (laughs) at at my facility one day. I thought these were cool. The little, uh, the custom built walk mower or a push mower trailers. They hold two, two push mowers. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was, those are pretty neat. We didn't talk too much about them, but it's pretty handy to have something that's built for... A particular machine right well and i could see maybe some other stuff going on there too you might could put a sod cutter or you know i mean oh yeah so it wouldn't be just push mowers but i i like where you're going with that yeah mm-hmm. because it is a pain in the ass hauling a push mower around a golf course yeah you don't, well, you don't want to pick it up and put it in the back of the cart no nope. and then the trailers are too big so you're finding ratchet straps all over and yeah no, that, that was a good setup for sure. Yeah. I really like they had a man lift on, on property that, you know, or that was a piece of their uh, equipment for those would be so handy for anything. Oh, yeah. Especially like, you know, they had bigger trees there. I mean, anything you can do in house correctly and safely is always an awesome thing. Right. I would like to have it just around the shop for changing light bulbs and all, <laughs> some of that kind of stuff. That's right. That's right. I thought these were really cool, the shovel hangers. And those definitely had some age to them. Just the way that they were made just mm-hmm. is like perfect. Have you uh, been able to find any? I haven't done any yet? research on them yet. Yeah. I haven't looked for them. But they, I mean, they're so simple. And I don't know why they don't just sell them everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's something, maybe a hardware store, you know, if that's what they use, maybe they would know where to get it from, but I've never seen any available in my internet looking. Right. You know, there's tool hangers all over the place, but these that have these little notches in them are are pretty cool. Yeah. Well, then you can store like eight shovels or something on there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They're not going to slide around. They're not going to fall off. They they lock in. Mm-hmm. I like their water recycle area, and it mm-hmm. was indoors and heated too. Of course, I guess yeah. you got to kind of have that up there. Yeah, I like how theirs is like its own bay, to where like ours is kind of incorporated inside the shop. There, it's like an entire bay built to wash everything off. So this is like their their main wash bay, and then also kind of their their detailing area. Mm-hmm. When I'm just now noticing, he built uh, one of the things that rolls up under the decks to wash out under like a rotary deck. It's hanging up on the wall there. Oh, yeah. I didn't even see that when I we were I didn't even notice there. it when we were walking around. Yeah, getting a, underneath there. I mean, you can get like the little ones from CarQuest or Vance, but that one is, that one will go all the way under. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's homemade setup. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember if it was uh, Kevin Henniger that kind of come up with that or who who's whose idea that was that w- we've all started to steal but borrow idea. borrow prefer to use the term borrow borrow yes yes <laughs> yes yep you're correct borrow i never even would have thought that there was a storage area behind those bins when we were just walking by oh no yeah I, yeah so they had uh indoor sand storage and then underneath that was a basement which was a little scary but a ton of space down there Mm -hmm. the details that that chad has in his equipment is just amazing like the cutting units and numbering and marking and just it's the little details that go such a long way there that was that was so cool 
so cool to be able to meet Chad and, and see his operations firsthand is was really special. I'm I'm very thankful I was able to join you guys for that. No, for sure. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It was an incredible experience, and yeah, writing down your real diameter on the frame of the reel, just so you know. Mm-hmm. If you're ever curious, you know it's right there. Yeah. Yep. Super cool. And then after that, we went over to Toro, which we had to sign our life away and we can't talk about any of it, but it was a super awesome time. It was a great time. Yeah, it was Yeah, very, very cool. And mm-hmm. we hung out with Jeff Drake, one of the engineers, awesome dude, and uh, got to tour that. All the R&D stuff, just super cool what they're doing there. Very, very cool. Yeah, it was neat. to. It, it's always good to be able to see the tour facility and and see jeff and it just a awesome group of people there and it's really cool really cool to to be part of that well and then jeff kind of got to pick our brain too so that that was good and it's always good to give back and to talk to an engineer and he knows what our role is and that was another cool thing i didn't realize how much jeff and chad had worked together on equipment stuff over mm-hmm. the years. And I think it's really cool that they're doing that and working with someone like Chad. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. So when they, when the products are ready, they're, they're ready. Yep. For sure. You want to talk about shop tours? Yeah. So kind of the, your little trip up here to Wisconsin kind of inspired me to think of some new ways to provide education for the Wisconsin chapter or, or any local chapter yours as well and and i wanted to pick your brain a little bit but spending a couple hours at chad's we weren't there for a crazy long time and we were able to see so much and learn so much in that short period of time that i was like man if we can get like kind of geographically located golf courses that are within we'll just say a 30 minute drive from one another that would be willing to open up their shops it's I think it'd be really cool to have a pure educational session that doesn't really involve like formal education, you know, to where you're sitting down and having a projector and all that fun stuff that comes along with it, Mm -hmm. but just doing it to where you can go and get a group together and, and tour these facilities and meet the guys. And, and I was thinking even just in our little area up here, because I mean, you saw how remote Sand Valley is in comparison to the cities and like you always said, to, to build that network with your neighbors. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be really cool to kind of even have it to where it's like, Hey, today we're doing shop tours. Justin's going to run a shop tour in the Milwaukee area. And then we'll do one in central Wisconsin, but it's like all in the same day. And it's like, if you can make it to these areas, come on out, no pressure, pretty casual. Have yeah. you guys done anything like that? No, we haven't, but I think that's an excellent idea. And especially if you're in an area where there's quite a few courses together, I mean, why not? I mean, even if you're not in an area, maybe you got to drive a little bit further. Mm-hmm. But I know here in Atlanta, you could be to, you know, 10 courses in 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that you could visit them, but just, you know, logistics wise, driving around, mm-hmm. it wouldn't, wouldn't take that long. Yeah. And you could hit whatever two, three, four a day. Yeah. You know, you, you start off at eight in the morning or nine in the morning at one place and do a couple hours, drive a couple hours, drive a couple hours. And then, you know, it's a full day, but you saw three operations, you met some new folks and you saw their tips and tricks and then building your network. And so I was just, it, it kind of inspired me to think like, Hey, maybe we should consider doing more of that. Cause we always try to provide education. That's very informative and and sitting down and and anything you can provide and get like ceus for which we're all thankful for and we want to push for but i think we have so much to learn from each other and honestly i think that'll help build the local chapter too it's going to get more people connected with one another and get people inspired to become a member if they weren't before and then i guess that leads into emcps and ctim right right yeah no for sure i think that's an excellent idea And it just, anytime you can meet your neighbor down the road and get a little bit of a connection or relationship going there, the better off you are. And visiting different shops, you find that, especially shops in your area, you find out what equipment they have. And you might need to borrow something. 
they might mm-hmm. need to borrow something from you, especially in the times we live in now where we can't get parts when we need to. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's an excellent idea. That's kind of a goal of mine. I'm gonna steal that. Year. I'm gonna borrow that idea from you. Awesome. And I okay. hope a lot of other people borrow that idea too. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh coming on. I guess you got anything else you wanna cover? Oh man, I just it was so much fun. I the week flew by and it, it really helped kind of reignite the fire a little bit, you know. And I think it was it was a fun trip. Great to see you up here in Wisconsin. Next time you'll bring a stocking cap up, but you yes, just never know yes, what the yes, weather's going to be. I was, not, I was not prepared. <laughs> yeah. I no, it was. Yeah, I, I didn't know the, the wind blew 10 to 15 miles an hour nonstop. Yeah, there's nothing to block the wind out here at Sand Valley. Yeah, n- not a whole lot of trees out there. Thank you for coming up. Thank you for teaching for the local chapter. And it, it was a it was a fun week. Met some really cool people along the way, so. It was special. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It was. And I mean, it was, I think you said it, right? It was one of them things that you kind of talk about. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get up there sometime. Well, we finally did it. And how much mm-hmm. fun was it? It was awesome. Very, yep. very cool. We'll have to plan the next trip. Yeah, no, we'll we'll definitely do another one. And unfortunately, this trip, uh, J.R. Wilson wanted to come with me. And his uh, daughter had a sports obligation or something. And he couldn't get away. But I, I plan on keep doing these from time to time as as much as i can afford it and if anybody needs me to come speak that helps too so yeah at least covers our hotel or two provides the motivation to do it yes yes for sure well thanks austin hope you enjoy your day and thanks again for putting me up and uh hanging out with me hey thank you trent you're always welcome to come back to wisconsin anytime Thank you so much for listening to the Real Turf Techs podcast. I hope you learned something today. Don't forget to subscribe. If you have any topics you would like to discuss or you'd like to be a guest, find us on Twitter at Real Turf Techs. See you bye.